Welcome to the Vet to Vet Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Fitters. Join me as I talk to fellow veterans about their military experiences. Experiences from Vietnam to Operation Enduring Freedom. This podcast is sponsored by Tugs. Talking, understanding, growing, and supporting. Even big ships need a little help sometimes. Feel free to hit the subscribe button below to get our latest Vet to Vet interview. Feel free to like, share, and leave a comment below. And thanks for joining us. We're here with uh, hull technician Jeff Ditzenberger. How are we doing tonight, Jeff? I'm good. I'm a little tired, but I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I but hear you. It's, it's a long drive down here to big old Orfordville. It is. The metropolis. See all the skyscrapers in the middle? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of big buildings down here, Bill. There are. I'm pretty sure the stop signs are taller than most of the buildings <laughs> around here. But so let's talk about when... Uh, I don't know, growing up, what, where were we from? Uh, South Wayne, Wisconsin is a little town of about 400 people. Um, and he thought Orville was small. <laughs> we had a grocery store, a <laughs> restaurant, two restaurants, actually. I don't know, like four bars, uh, two gas stations. Uh, the gas stations are still there, actually. And one, of the, one of the restaurants is, is still there, the Squeeze Inn, which is now Cheryl Jean's. My uncle, my Uncle Quint, actually helped build that. Ah, okay. Uh, but us kids used to hop across the street and go there for lunch and stuff like that if we had a responsibility pass and it was great because when i wrestled i wrestled in the 98 pound weight class i weighed 89 and when everybody else is in the <laughs> weight rooms and boiler rooms trying to lose weight i was over having a cheeseburger and fries over at the squeeze in uh they call it that because it's about as big as this room here to be quite honest um small dairy farm family farm so and then my uncle and grandfather's farm was just up the road um, on Dill Road, so we did a lot of stuff back and forth together, and then Dad and my uncle split, uh, I don't know, it was like 84-ish or something like that. They still did some stuff together, but not quite as much as what they were doing before, and then uh, I graduated in 88 from Blackhawk High School, go Warriors, hoorah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and they're still called the Warriors too, which kind of surprises me <laughs> considering everything that's gone on right? in, the, in, the, in the world these days. Um, and then, uh, uh, that summer that I graduated, I was 17 and, uh, uh, was helping a couple other farmers too, just to make some extra money and, and, uh, rolled dad's truck and, uh, buddy of mine was thrown out the back. Um, he got a scratch on his arm. I didn't get a thing out of it. Uh, but it didn't sound like it was going to end real well for me with my <laughs> parents. Uh, dad went to look at the truck. I actually loaded up my motorcycle and, and left home and went camping for a weekend, <laughs> called mom that night. Uh, I actually went up to Reverend Yeager's campground up by Lone Rock, which is a place that we used to build houses for Habitat for Humanity, and uh, stayed in one of the TPs that night <laughs> and uh, called mom. And I'm like, just go ahead and sign the papers. I, I'm ready to go in. And... Uh, I was enlisted then like a week later and then left another two weeks after that, I think, to actually start my boot camp at uh, Great Lakes. Um, I will have to say that first night at Great Lakes or the first morning at Great Lakes um, when they threw the trash cans and stuff down the, the the center of the aisle and whatnot, I'm pretty sure I went into the fetal position and was ready to be back <laughs> home milking cows again. But uh, Ready to face that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> It's like, oh, maybe it's not so bad, but, <laughs> but uh, no. So it was nice. It was kind of cool. My my grandfather went to Great Lakes. My dad went to Great Lakes, and then I went to Great Lakes, and then my brother eventually went to Great Lakes. Um, so yeah, it was kind of cool to kind of keep it all in the family that way. Good family history. My dad actually went to Great Lakes as well with the Navy. Mm-hmm. So your dad was smarter than you. Were, <laughs> trying to say it, Bill. Yeah, well. No offense to any of the other Air Force guys out there. I like all you. It's just Bill that I have an issue with. So. <laughs> So then we graduated basic, where did we go to our school at? Uh, I went to a school in Philadelphia, which was a huge culture shock for me because <laughs> there was, like, more people in the, in the building that I went to school with than there was in all of South Wayne. Um, but uh, I went to school for welding and plumbing, pipe fitting, uh, firefighting, damage control. Um, I really enjoyed it because I had always been kind of hands-on. Grams had me – Grams actually had me holding a welder when I was, like, 12. Um and I, it was, it was cool. Met a lot of really, really cool people there. Um, had a blast in Philly. <laughs> Left my mark there, I'm pretty sure. Um, but uh, school was, school was pretty cool. It was, 
Honestly, I was glad to be away from home. I really was. And all, all, all things considered, it was kind of nice to be kind of trying to come into my own. Um, I was actually dating, a, I was still dating my high school sweetheart uh, at that time. And then we ended up actually getting married. Um, it was funny. I, got, I had to have my parents sign for me to get in the military. And then it wasn't terribly long, really, after my 18th birthday that I was that I was getting hitched, and then uh, got my, once I graduated A school, uh, and I graduated with pretty well, actually, the, like, the first school I ever did good in, <laughs> and it didn't have recess, so, um, but uh, uh, after that, then I got orders to uh, Long Beach, California, to uh, the USS Wabash, which was kind of cool, too, because I found out later that um, the, the pier that I was at, uh, my grandfather's ship was, like, right around the corner from there, and then dad's wasn't too far from there either. Ooh, so wow. it was kind of like all like, again, like the same. Because I was actually born in Long Beach. My dad was in the in the service when I was ah, born. Yeah. Right. So so one of the first things I did when I got to California is, you know, see if I could find the, you know, St. Mary's Hospital, which was, there's it's still there, but it's not at all <laughs> the same. Like, it's it's a lot bigger, apparently. Um, but, and it was actually on a different street. But I did find where it was at. And, and I thought Philly was a culture shock, but oh, my God. California, dude. Yeah. Like, first of all, so Chips was popular back when I was a kid. Right, you know, right. California Highway Patrol um, yep. uh, show. Ponch and John. Ponch and John, <laughs> yep. There ain't none of those type of ladies out there, first of all. Second of all, the beaches were bare. Like, every time I went to the beach, I'm like, what, what am I doing here? Uh, very expensive. Very culture shockish. Uh, the ship that I was on, pretty damn cool, though. It was... Uh, um, funny little story though, about like two weeks before I got out, I was over at the, I was over at the, on the base and, uh, I heard this voice and I'm like, Oh my God, that sounds like a guy I know. And I go around the corner and here's my buddy, Lance Altman ah. and, uh, Lance and I actually enlisted at the same time. Well, I got held back a week where well, I was supposed to go with this brewer company, with Milwaukee brewer company. I got held back a week cause there was a problem with my ankles and I want to make sure it wasn't going to be detrimental. And then they just waved me anyways. <laughs> but uh, here this whole time that we were in, Lance and I were two ships away from each other, never wow. crossed paths that whole time, and then end up, you know, I'm two weeks from getting out, he's a week from getting out, you know, and he's like, oh, we should hang out. I'm like, dude, we can hang out back home. Like, I don't, I don't want to hang out in California with you. Are you kidding me? But met a lot of really cool people in California. My wife moved out there. Um, actually, my damage control chief, my chief petty officer, uh, so for for our division, repair division, whole techs and damage control guys were in the same division. But damage control were strictly firefighters. I mean, that's all they they, they didn't have any other skills and check the fire extinguisher and check the hoses. But whole technicians, we we actually fixed stuff. We did ship designs. We did plumbing. Um, we did firefighting systems, all that kind of stuff. Um, but. Uh, I really liked my damage control chief. Like he was super nice, and he helped me through. I went through a lot of stuff on the ship that uh, <laughs> kind of paid the way for a lot of other stuff I went through <laughs> later in life. But um, uh, Chief Robel, actually, when Facebook came out, like three years after I was on Facebook, all of a sudden I get this friend request from him. I'm like, it can't possibly be. <laughs> well, sure as sure as heck, here, here's Chief Robel. And uh, he had actually driven by my place like numerous times on his Harley, oh, wow. going to the going to the biker club that's just up the road from me. So we actually uh, we've gotten together a few times. You know, he's come to the farm a couple times, and this summer he came up. Him and his wife both ride. Uh, they came up and got some sweet corn from Luke's Lush's sweet corn stand. I have a little sweet corn stand in the summertime. So yeah, it was a it was kind of a good deal. Neat. I'm trying to figure out why that isn't moving. How's it? Good? Let's do this real quick. This is what happens when you get a brand new computer. There it is. It's going. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, wow, I can really look still for a long time. <laughs> I would have had a great seal. <laughs> like the one that flaps with a freaking ball on his nose. But anyways. So when you're out in California, did you guys go out at all? Bolt, um, bolt yeah. Walk? So we did some qualification stuff down in San Diego. And then when Desert um, Operation Desert Storm broke out, we had actually we were on Westpac at the time and on our way back, and the ship that was supposed to replace us couldn't pass their <laughs> couldn't pass their qualifications, so they turned our happy asses back around. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, why did 
why is the sun setting in the opposite of what it did yesterday? You know, you know, uh, down, you know when you're downstairs all the time, you don't get out that much. But uh, so we ended up, we ended up uh, uh, steaming for a while and uh, for Desert Storm. Um, Wabash is an oil replen- uh, AOR five, so it's an oil replenishment, ammunition oil replenishment ship. Uh, we were basically a floating 7-Eleven time bomb. Oh. Uh, you know, and I always, you know, I always joke, like, when I give my, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but when I give my presentations and, and I'm showing the picture of my ship, I'm like, you see these two little R2-D2 units with a Gatling gun? Yeah, that's what we had. And they're called closed-in weapon systems, but they were nowhere close to where they should be most times. So, and then we had, like, six missiles on top. And I can remember when we went out for our quals, they would fly this plane, and it had this great big balloon, basically, behind it. We never hit one of those. And they still passed us. I was like, where were those teachers when I was going through high school? But uh, <laughs> so, but no, we um, we were an ammunition. So we were pretty we were pretty important. But at the same time, we had this. We had a uh, we had for the Seventh Fleet. We had a great big picture taken. It was the largest battalion uh, fleet battalion since um, Vietnam, and. Uh, picture is beautiful and it was the only time we ever really got to see the other ships because any other time we were 20 nautical miles from anything that we could blow up because if we got hit we were taking everything out right. around us but then when they needed fuel or food they're like oh hey can you come see us for a little <laughs> while so we'd pull up alongside them we'd shoot some lines over and we'd pull hoses over and they'd pull ho- hoses over and, and there was some ship stores stuff that we would send over on a on a, like the smaller stuff we'd send over on pulleys but otherwise we had two Hueys on the on the two twin prop uh, helicopters on the ship and they would normally take the ship oh, stores going back and forth but dude we <laughs> we half of this ship is diesel fuel half of this ship is is jet fuel and then we've got all this ammunition that we can't use. I'm like, what do we need this for? Uh, you know, we're running around with nine millimeters and friggin' 12 gauge shotguns. I'm pretty sure, uh, and some boomerangs. But so, uh, yeah, uh, and then everything else was was food. You know, and so yeah. I mean, our the 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 mid deck where we stored everything was just ginormous. He's great. I guess bigger than my machine shed I've got in the farm now, <laughs> but uh, it was pretty cool. Like you know, you just it, it, to 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 be able to do that. Like when we were up a cl- close to the Bering Straits, we'd have to do emergency breakaways because at that time Russia still was not still did not know how we were refueling ships. Okay. Under, so all of a sudden they you'd, you'd radar would pick up a Russian bear, not the big grizzly ones, the actual <laughs> uh, planes, the spy planes, and we'd have to do an emergency breakaway because we didn't want them to, to, to figure it out. The other thing that was kind of funny is that we were refueling some ships from, I think they're from Korea, if I remember right. And uh, I said to one of the guys, I'm like, my God, that looks like, those look like United States ships. And they're like, and the chief is like, oh, yeah, that's because they are, because we sold them to them, and then they painted them a little bit different or whatever. Way cooler paint job than we had, oh, I yeah. can tell you oh, that. Yeah. But uh, it was cool, because here we are refueling Korean ships. Like, so I thought, you know, some of that some of that stuff was kind of you know, like, okay, so Russia doesn't know how to do this. They they have people in space, but they can't. Yet Korea can pull up alongside us, and we're just like, okay, you know, send over some some Korean food, and we'll send you some fuel. So I thought that was I thought that was that was that was pretty cool. In Spain, they had the F fours. Yes, and we had the F sixteens, and we're like. They look familiar, and they're like, yeah, we didn't want to take them back to the States, so yeah. we sold them. <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, it was a lot easier to sell them. Because, to, 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 like, actually, a lot of the a lot of the Navy ships, what they'll do with them is they'll they'll you know, scavenge everything out of them they can, and they'll take them out in the middle of the ocean, and they'll blow them up. And, yeah, I've seen that. And uh, which just, uh, I'm thinking to myself, you know, if the price of steel is that way decent, take that thing to the freaking, <laughs> take it to Bear Salvage and get a little bit of something out of it, but... But, um, you know, I, I guess part of it is they don't want the designs copied and stuff like that. And of course, I'm going, okay, this ship is two years younger than I am. Nobody's going to copy that design by any means. But uh, it was cool. Like, I got to go on the aircraft carrier and do some repairs. Uh, t- dude, that, that they're, was one of those. They're floating cities. That was, that was one of the highlights of my Navy career. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie. Uh, they took me up to, like, the 09 level. Oh. So the way the ship is, is your deck level is zero, and then everything up is 01, 02, 03, 04, and everything below is one to is E, one, two, three. So I'm like, oh, dude, like, I'm way up here. <laughs> and they were doing flight ops. So I got to oh, see the neat. planes taken off. And it was the thing that was cool about it is they were the guy that I was with because they won't let even though I'm in the Navy and this is a Navy ship, you can't walk around the, the carrier by yourself. You have to have a running mate. And so, anyways, 
uh, so we're walking around or whatever, and then we go up and watch this. And he was telling me how when they catapult those, sh- those ships, when they catapult those planes off the ship, the plane actually drops mm-hmm. off the edge of the deck. Like, you know this. I do. Whatever. See, you're in the airport. You don't know. <laughs> Let me tell my story, Bill. You said it was my story. So anyways, it drops out, and, and take, which I thought was really, really cool. Now, the newer aircraft carriers, though, one of the things that they were telling me, they told me, too, is, like, the safety officers and everybody were, like, on the deck. And they show this safety training of one of the, the, that was from years ago where a plane comes in and as it catches the line, the line snaps and you actually see a sailor on the ship get cut in half. They, yeah. they caught it on film and uh, they use it as a safety training now. Um, but like the newer car- the newer carriers, are the Reagan and those, they actually have a bubble that the, that the supervisors and stuff are in, you know, so now you've got minimal crew, but to watch them, you know, and, and you go down into the, into the storage, the garage the plane garage or the, I mean, there's helicopters, there's planes, there's, yeah. there's all the, and there's just like for as far as the eye can see, it's just, uh, you can't describe to someone how awesome that is unless you're actually, you know, actually in there. And then, um, I also got to, I had I actually got some really good pictures of it. The, uh, uh, one of the battleships firing their guns. And I was talking to one of those guys that got to go over to uh, work on one of those. And I was talking to one of the old salts and, and, uh, I'm like, so, you know, how accurate are these things? He's like, we don't need accuracy, kid. He's like, we're going to take out everything in a 30-mile radius. So as long as we're even getting it off of the ship, nobody cares. And it was cool because they found out on those, like, they have to aim the gun a little bit lower than what they actually are, what the actual trajectory is. Because the recoil is so much, it actually shifts the ship to the really? side. And push, the, yeah. So, and then the other thing I got to do with the battleship is I actually stood, this is my, this is my claim to fame story. I actually got to st- stand security for share oh, for the turn nice. for the turn back time video and of course the joke after she straddled that gun was that that gun misfired ever since <laughs> um but i got to have my picture taken with her and, and and stuff like that and i grew up with sunny and share my little 13 inch black and white tv <laughs> you know and mom said the first song i ever sang was i got you babe by sunny and share or whatever and she said i did both parts i don't know what the hell that's all about i'm but, gonna uh, black your mom right black your mom <laughs> exactly. till we get that video exactly uh so um and then the only other really cool story really fun story about about my navy career i mean i enjoyed my navy career but i'm kind of that guy that's like i i wouldn't go you know i wouldn't give it up for a million dollars but i wouldn't go back for two i had a chief my 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 chief not my damage control chief but my my whole tech chief was a power hungry individual and it really saw i mean i when i enlisted at 17 billy i actually thought i'd be in for 20 and then after a couple of things i mean i got knocked down reduction in rank for something i didn't really do um, you know, I mean, this chief sent me to captain's or sent me to executive officer mast five times. And finally the fifth time the exo was like, I got to send it again. I'm like, so you still can't prove anything because I didn't do anything wrong, but because this guy's got it out for me, you know, and when I first got on, I mean, I did a, we did a whole ships, uh, we were, we had to redo the entire mess deck, uh, all the piping, everything, all the steam line, everything. So instead of becoming a mess cook, my when I had to do my mess duty um, stuff, the chief, the chief and the executive officer were like, hey, how about if we just have you do all the welding stuff for us? And I'm like, <laughs> why you're here? Right. I got four letters of accommodation from the captain within my first year on the ship. You know, and I mean, I was, you know, were they shit hot squared away as they used to yeah. call us. Um, and then this guy gets on board, and of course. I might have had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because I, so when I got done doing all of the work for the for the mess deck, then I got to go up in the officer's mess deck and I actually got to be an officer mess cook. And of course, this one officer was like, hey, can you make me a, a frame for like my VCR? My, I'm like, you're just VCRs and TVs? Like, we don't even, the, how? Like, like, so, anyways, I did. I made this really cool bracket. Well, then a bunch of the other officers found out about it. So I made a whole bunch of them. Well, then the cool thing was, though, is that like they ate breakfast and then they, they did whatever they didn't you know so you didn't have to be there for all all the meals but the cook that was up there like the officers had steak and like oh, made to order omelets and stuff like that i'm like i'm i'm good i'm staying up here <laughs> but anyways we picked up some midshipmen in japan when we were when we were out and uh so they bring us all together and uh, uh my my division they bring us together and they're like so we're picking up these midshipmen in japan and uh, there's one being assigned here, Ditsenberger, you get to run with her. And I was like, what? <laughs> and they're like, 
you're going to be her running mate. And I'm like, I heard what you said, but <laughs> but it's a her. And they're like, yeah, there's a couple females. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Why me? And they're like, well, she's from Wisconsin. I'm like, I don't care. Like, what does that have to do with it? Like, uh, because I'm from Wisconsin, you automatically assume I want to run with somebody from Wisconsin? So anyways, she the, we didn't get to meet before. We didn't get to meet before we got to run together, and I was on midwatch. So midwatch, of course, is twelve to oh four hundred. <laughs> and uh, in my navy, we show up at a quarter two. Like <laughs> you don't mess around. You're there fifteen minutes before, and uh, I'm I'm what like I've got my watch setting right on <laughs> right on it because I'm watching it. It's already you know five minutes too, and she comes waltzing in and she's like, re- she started to say something, and I'm like. I just want you to know, and my and I, you know, I know she's gonna be an officer someday, but right now she's nobody to me. I want you to know that in my navy, we show up fit, and all of a sudden I hear this. Oh my God, it's little Jeff Ditzenberger, and I looked up, and here was a gal that I have built houses with for oh. Habitat for Humanity. Oh my! And I was just like, Oh my God, Becky! <laughs> she's like, You recognize me? I'm like, Not really, because you're. And I started hearing myself saying, You're a lot prettier than you. <laughs> But I stopped. I said, "Yeah, you're a lot taller than you, <laughs> which everybody's tall to me because I, you know, five foot seven or whatever." But, uh, dude, it was the coolest. Like, it was really, really cool. And it was funny that that happened. That was one of those life events that was kind of good because when I first met her at Habitat, she was sweet, super sweet gal. Uh, but Coke bottle glasses and plain hair and kind of pudgy, you know. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> and. Dude, she could have passed for a model. Like she just totally, you know, slimmed up and no glasses anymore, you know, and stuff like. And we had so much fun for that four hours. Like we, that was the best watch I had ever been on. We <laughs> laughed about stuff and and uh, and whatnot. So it just, you know, when you think of the whole gamut of everything that could possibly happen, and then you have someone who you knew that you pick up in Japan of all places. Like, what the hell are the chances of that happening? Right, right. So, so yeah. So then I did my, I did my, I did my, uh, actually three full years active duty. And then I was on the three by, I think I was a three by four program. It's three or four or three or five. I can't remember. Um, and then I got out and did, uh, did my year reserves. Uh, and that's when I started having some psychiatric problems and some other stuff. And then the Navy was actually, the military as a whole was actually, doing some budget cut stuff and i had an opportunity for an early out and I, the reserves was a joke to me i mean it really was i mean i was ready to go back full duty because where were you, where were you going to at that uh madison up to um it's off of fair oaks like i can remember the address but i can't it's right next to truax field oh, over there okay. or whatever but dude like you go to the like you go to for the weekend training stuff and you wear your dungarees and you report in the morning and you freaking mop floors and polished brass and i'm like this is not what i signed up for you know and and uh uh, like i said i that's when i started well i I found out my wife had been cheating on me basically the whole time we dated on through the marriage and everything else i mean she was already already uh seeing someone else six weeks after six weeks after we got married while i was over in in uh in over in iraq and uh, for the guys listening out there, if well, <laughs> so I found her diary. And for those of you that don't know what a diary is, back in the day we used to like write stuff in books to keep there. You know, now we just post it on Facebook. Now we just yep, then he up posts on Facebook. It comes up as a memory a year later, two years or whatever. Anyways, I read her diary. Bad idea. Found out a lot of stuff I really didn't want to find out. Um, I was struggling with some post traumatic stress from some stuff that had happened and and uh, a, f- a few other things and. And at that time, you know, that would have been 90-ish, 91, you know. That was still back in the day when, you know, guys didn't talk about their mental health problems. Right. Guys didn't cry. Guys didn't. And I was in a bad state. Um, not Wisconsin. <laughs> confusion. Uh, just a lot of things going on. Uh, and when the military gave my gave me my option to, to get out early, I, I took it. Um, I just, my last year on board was not that pleasant. So that kind of already started to spiral my my. Cause, I mean, they were offering me a pretty good reenlistment bonus, choice of orders, you know. And I had I'd really wanted to go to Bremerton. I thought Bremerton would be awesome. And and uh, you know now I look at it, and here I am, fifty years old, and I could have been retired for freaking right, right. But when you're when you're twenty years old and things are just not good, like you don't think about that. Like fifty seems like a long ways away, you know. I was just telling friend of mine the other day i'm like yeah i remember my mom was 30 and i thought that was ancient now i am here i am a 50 year old grandfather you know it's like uh but um 
yeah, so then I got out. Uh, I started working um, for a, and I actually had the job lined up before I even got back. I started working for an agricultural company that made uh, alfalfa hay cubes. Basically, we take chopped alfalfa, chopped hay, uh, dried, put it into uh, this processor and make little bales out of it. And then we bagged it. We sold it for um, uh, rabbits and, you know, pets at home, basically. And uh, they were having some they were having some struggles. And then I got hired on a farm. And at the same time I got hired at, at this farm, um, I got uh, hired at a wastewater treatment plant not too far from, from home in Judah, Wisconsin, um, that did the wastewater treatment for the whey plant and the cheese factory that were, were down there. Uh, it was a great gig. Seven days on, seven days off. Oh, so nice. time, you know, so when you took a week's vacation, you basically had three weeks off, <laughs> you know, so you started your shift at eight o'clock at night, the one night and you went until midnight and then you came back in the next night and it was, um, seven or eight to eight every single. And then your last shift was another four hour shift. So you had your, you know, you had your, your 80 hours in, and in, in a week and, uh, they decide, and the, so here's where I first was really starting to struggle with, from my aspect, some some psychological problems, um, and uh, uh, there was some things that were going on that weren't real kosher, and the wastewater treatment plant was trying to uh, get me to lie on the stand. They were getting sued by, or getting investigated by the DNR. Uh, I had the yeah. DNR in my house like numerous times. Uh, my marriage was falling apart. I knew it was kind of it was kind of falling apart. Uh, I was drinking like a fish and I was, I was trying to get in to get some help. And, uh, you know, that was one of some of my first, uh, run-ins with the VA. And back then it was, it's, it was pretty stringent. Like you, you know, unless you were dying, you weren't going to get in. So I, my insurance kicked in and, you know, I got, but the thing of it is with insurance and mental health, like you got to go through like basically three sessions of just the insurance crap before you can actually start getting any help mm-hmm. so i started reaching out to my guy friends and they were like oh suck it up buttercup you know you're a soldier for crying out loud you should <laughs> and you know so then you start putting a little bit of some bourbon in your freaking coffee in the morning and then uh <laughs> dude i damn near put it in my fruit loops um and then i was putting it into my coffee to go to work uh drinking that throughout the day and then uh it, at lunch, go down to the bar and have a burger and a beer, and then on the way home, grab another 12-pack of something or a bottle of something and, and hammer that down. And still functioning physically, but mentally, I was just I was going into a place, Billy, that wasn't good. And a divorce will do that, and that's, that's common uh, amongst military uh, members, what have you. Uh, so... Where did you go from when the VA wasn't there to uh, private insurance? At what point did you start getting help? Well, I never, so it was probably the VA and I, VA and I went back and forth for about two months. And then my insurance was there, so I started going to, to the clinic. But I waited six weeks to get in to see anybody. Um, the only reason I got in was because somebody canceled an appointment. And they mm-hmm. called me and said, can you come in? And... Um, you know the thing is is that we had like two sessions and then they put me on Prozac and Clonopin for my PTSD and my depression and all the other things that I was going through at that time what's really interesting about Prozac is that the number one side effect from it is suicidal thoughts <laughs> you know so it's like oh this is great like you know and I had already been I had already been having some suicidal thoughts at that point in time um and I uh, started having more booze with psychiatric medication. Um, thank God I didn't get on, and I'm not, I'm not begrudging anybody that gets into hard drugs because I know what addiction is like. Addiction is addiction. I don't care if it's alcohol, sex, gambling, whatever. An addiction is an addiction, and I would not wish that pain on anyone. Uh, but I, I thank God every day and we got into the drugs, you know, never smoked an ounce of weed, never got into, you know, any of that kind of stuff. And, you know, that was the kind of the funny thing, too, is that, you know, the first smell of marijuana I ever had was in the military. And the only reason <laughs> I got to smell it was because as security guards, we had to know what it smelled like. Like right. I, I and, and to this day, I mean, I'm 50 years. I just turned 50 in September. 
I still have yet to, to smoke a joint, you know, and I've been <laughs> offered a million times and, and stuff like that, but I've just, I've never been around, like, I kind of want to, but I've never been around it, you know, <laughs> and uh, I'm a huge CBD oil fan, you know, or whatever, and I can remember giving some to my mom when I first started selling it, and my mom's like, I just wish they legalized marijuana so I could smoke it again, and I was like, <laughs> what do you mean again? And mom's like, Jeffrey, I'm a product of the 70s. And I'm like, I was born in 70s. Well, that explains a few things of why you married dad. But anyway, so, so but anyways, um, booze is so easily freaking accessible, dude. Yeah. Like, it's as easy accessible as what freaking water is when it comes right down to it. And, and it's an easy uh, nerve, uh, I don't want to say killer, but suppressor. No, it, it, it can kill some nerves, too. I mean, I was to the point where I I honestly, Billy, don't know how I was functioning. I really don't. I mean, the amount of alcohol that I was going through, I should have been dead. I really should have. And uh, so it was getting close to my mom's birthday. It was a big one for her. I think it was her I better not say because that'll then people will figure out how old she is. But it was a one that ended in a zero. Anyway, so <laughs> so I wanted to have a surprise birthday party for her. And uh, I had already been contemplating my suicide by this time. And uh, I put about a good eight weeks of effort into my planning. I wrote a letter. Uh, I went and saw some people I hadn't seen. You know, all the telltale signs oh, that, we, yeah. that, we, that we talk about nowadays a little bit more. I mean, it's still not the conversation that anybody really wants to have. And um, we had my mom's birthday party, and it went off without a hitch. Uh, mom was totally surprised. Uh, Dad and I drank together for the first time ever in my life that night. Um, and I remembered his favorite drink, which was Seven and Sevens. And, uh, and well, he likes whiskey sours too. But um, So we had a few Seven and Sevens. And, and I, like I said, I had read my wife's diary and found out that she had been cheating on me basically six weeks after we got married. And, you know, all this stuff was crashing. And I was on the volunteer fire department at the time. And years later, quite a few years later, one of the psychiatrists I talked to actually figured out that he thinks that my low battery alarm is what actually went off on my page or not, that it was an actual tone. But it triggered. I mean, there's a word we use nowadays in a very derogatory manner, and it bugs the crap out of me. But it triggered something psychologically in me. And the next thing that I remember, I remember, to this, to this day, I remember almost everything now. There for a while, there was things that my mind blocked out. But... I remember dropping my wife off and then going over to the fire station. What I don't remember, or I dropped my wife off, and then the next thing I did is I was at this old abandoned house. And uh, by this time, I didn't hear any traffic on the radio and stuff. And, you know, I was like, this is this is where I'm just going to cash it in. I've, I've had enough. Um, you're stopped again. No, we're good. Okay. It's, I see it's still rolling down okay. here. Uh, just your oh there we go oh so, <laughs> don't let me tell you how to do your job uh, it just so, keeps going into sleep mode gotcha so uh anyways um i thought this would be a good place to, to end it and so oh, the, the, the thing i joke about now is that if you want to set yourself up for failure on a suicide is write your note on a piece of paper and then put it in your pocket and then go in and light a building on fire yeah, nobody will ever read that note. <laughs> you know, that you, you don't think about that at the time, but, you know, I kind of joke about it now. Um, that, you know, that, that's like, dude, like, like, you want everybody to know, but apparently you don't. And uh, But I ended up calling the fire. The next thing I know, like, it was, this might sound a little bit crazy, and I am, so I can actually I can actually say that. But, like, I felt like like it was almost like, like an out-of-body experience. Like, I, mm -hmm. I like, like, I was looking at myself from a distance type thing and uh next thing i know i'm like what the freaking hell am i doing in here i went next door i dialed 911 and then i came back with the fire department because it was a fire department i was on at the time and and uh thank god for scott schmidt uh scott was one of the firefighters that i was very very fond of uh, scott has actually since passed he uh, died from cancer here a few years ago i actually took over santa for him um and scott and i had a very good relationship uh, but he he said something, you know, and and he's like, "Did something's not right? Something's not right." And I'm like, "No, I'm good. I'm good. You know, whatever." Well, then the next day, I had to milk cows that morning. It's like four in the morning. We got done, so I went right straight to milking. Well, apparently, I missed milking one or two of the cows, and I I knew something wasn't right, but I wasn't about to tell anybody. 
Right. No way in hell was I going to tell anybody. So, uh, Sergeant Pepper, that's actually what his, uh, <laughs> super nice guy. Actually, I think you might know him. I do. Uh, detect- he was, he was Detective Pepper at the time, I believe. I was called him Sergeant Pepper just because of the, the Sergeant Pepper and the, and the Lonely Hearts Club band. Uh, but anyways, he calls me up and he's like, we think you've got some vital information in regards to this fire last night. And I'm like, well, I just want to help, you know? So I go up there and he goes, well, he says, I'm pretty sure we're pretty sure you did it. And I'm like, no way. And he goes, well, there's, you have two options. I can either arrest you or you can go to the psychiatric hospital because I think you've, or a mental institute is what he called it. And I, you know, I hate that word. I, 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 I absolutely despise the word mental institution. Um, you know, back in the day, they used to call them the insane asylum. And asylum itself is a positive word. It's mm-hmm. a place of respite. It's a place of rest. It's a place to, to, to be safe. And I'll tell you what, those people that were in insane asylums were not safe at all. No. And uh, so I took the, I chose the lesser of two evils and took the mental, mental hospital. And um, the funny thing is, is that I never told anybody that it was a suicide attempt. And the reason that is is because I was less embarrassed to be charged with felony arson than to admit that I had problems. But really, that three day stint in the mental institution, which was on the which was on Four West at the time, up at up at St. Clair Hospital, was one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had in my life. Like everybody was the same. Everybody understood that mm-hmm. what you were going through. Nobody told you to suck it up, Buttercup. Nobody told you to have another drink. You know, there was a guy up there that swore to God that he was a chicken and he was the nicest freaking man I ever met. Like, we had very in-depth conversations just every once in a while. <laughs> you know, and, and we laugh about it, you know. And, and, and I have a deeper appreciation after seeing what I saw because after – so after my emergency detention uh, – they took me in handcuffs, which is very humbling, up to the courthouse, had my hearing. They let me go on signature bail, charged me with felony arson. You know, and I'm listening to them read this, and it's potential of 20 years in prison. And I'm like, dude, like, nope, don't tell them. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. Don't tell them that you got problems. Don't tell them. You know, so then, um, you know, it was front page news, you know, volunteer firefighter charged with arson. Uh, you know, did some burgers, not a very common name, so everybody knew me. You know, and and uh, I don't know. It's probably about a week, week after everything. I admitted myself back into Fort West, and it was my only safe place. You know, we mm-hmm. talk about safe places now and make jokes of them and stuff, but sometimes people need that, Bill. Sometimes mm-hmm. people need yeah. some place to go where they do feel, where they do feel safe. And I don't give a damn if there's anybody that thinks that that's weak or whatever. Like it's tough to make that decision to put yourself mm-hmm. back into that into that position. The only good thing about it was is that I had the opportunity to let my to get myself back out of there whenever right. I wanted to. Yeah, it was you know, voluntary. So, yep. So that yep. was that, it. Was nice to have some of that control back. Mm-hmm. So then you go through all the court hearings. You know, it's in the freaking paper. Every freaking court hearing was in the paper. Um, and then they ended up. Uh, so they gave me nine months county jail, five years probation. And then ten thousand dollars in restitution to pay back this, to the this abandoned house that I burned to pay back the insurance company, which the property values went up after they pulled those that house down anyway. So I kind of felt like I was doing the guy a favor, but whatever. <laughs> uh, so, um, anyways, so then um, we, uh, so I did my I did my jail time. I actually had another suicide attempt when I was in, or suicide thought uh, attempt when I was um, in jail. Uh, got put on, you know, solitary confinement. So what made you what made you think of it while you were in jail? <sighs> Just like the whole loss of freedom and mm-hmm. and you know lack of control and I and I was I got it good. I mean I was on Huber, so I got to go to work and stuff like that. And and uh, you know they pack you this wonderful sack lunch with butter <laughs> on your bread and bologna. I hate butter on my bread. Uh, I'm like, where's the freaking slice of cheese for crying out loud? Uh, at least the bread was fresh. I mean, they're good people. I mean, it, don't get me wrong. I, you know, you, you, you screwed up, did some burger. You're going to get shit food. Um, I mean, crappy food. Sorry. Uh, so then, uh, uh, but it was not, you know, the 
company I was working for, you know, we were on the road quite a bit during the day, so we'd get stopped at McDonald's and stuff like that. So I, you know, I mean, I'd eat my Cheetos and my freaking <laughs> Nutter Butters and and uh, the choke down the sandwich or whatever. Um, so then after that, after that suicide attempt in in uh, in uh, jail, the funny thing is, is one of the jailers had actually dated his daughter. One of the jailers came up to me and he's like, "Dude, so what can I do?" And I'm like, tell them to get me some freaking help. And he goes, just ask. He goes, we, so Green, I, got, I got into Green County Human Services, and I met a guy by the name of Rob Miles. And Rob is phenomenal. Rob's actually still there. We're good friends now. We talk quite a bit. Um, and uh, so I got into some group therapy, and that, that helped. And then I was seeing Dr. Beck. And actually, uh, I know Dr. Dr. Beck actually helps Monroe Theater Guild, so I see him now. Uh, once in a while and, and stuff like that um, <clears throat> but we never talked about the word suicide still hmm. to this point we still have not talked about suicide at all um, so then um, I did my time and I actually got out early and got to do some community service instead uh, so there like 15 years ago up to about 15 years ago all the landscaping outside of the mineral arts center I had done uh, which was which was pretty cool. Um, in the meantime, um, just before I went into jail, my the, the 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 Dr. Beck had said, you know, find something that you enjoy that you know take your mind off of this. So I actually that that's when line dancing, country line dancing was. Yeah. Yep. I don't know why they call it country line dancing because there's no <laughs> rock and roll line dancing, but they call it country line dancing. <laughs> Anyways, I met this gal and she didn't have a she didn't have a dance partner and I didn't have a dance partner because I'm late to everything. And uh, so we, we kind of hit it off or whatever. Not in your Navy. Not in my Navy, yeah, <laughs> whatever. So, YMCA, boys, anyways. Uh, so, fuck off, Bill. Anyways, so we, uh, um, but I, like, wasn't interested in a relationship with her, really. And, and she's like, what do I need to do to get you to go out with me? And I was, like, I was going into jail, so I didn't really care at this point. And I'm like, I don't know, lose 70 pounds in your attitude, and we'll, we'll talk. Eight months later, <laughs> we had to talk, and uh, um, so we ended up we ended up getting married. Uh, had two beautiful children out of the deal, uh, but Parker, my son, was early. Uh, and going through that again, my brother was born uh, premature, also. And uh, the the kind of interesting thing that you know when you talk about small world events is that when we got up there to the hospital after Parker had been taken up in the ambulance. Um, it was the same primary nurse that my brother had. Really? Which is just the coolest thing. And my aunt, George, my aunt Georgia is a, is a uh, NICU or natal, uh, neonatal, instant, or neonatal intensive care unit nurse has been for years. So when the doctors are talking about how, you know, they've got hemoglobin, blah, 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 you know, she's like, oh, yeah, he's got a common cold. I'm like, why can't they say that? <laughs> uh, so it was kind of nice to have that that access again, too, you know. So it. It was like a big reunion. I mean, there was a bunch of nurses up there that had been up there when my brother was up there years years before that and stuff. But when my baby brother was born, I went through kind of some stress over that too. You know, there was 10 years difference between us. You know, all of a sudden, I'm all excited about him coming home. The next thing I know, he's up in the hospital for a month. You know, they don't know if he's going to live and all this other stuff. And I'm just like, like nobody's talking to me. Like, you know, nobody's right. giving me like the, the full scoop and stuff because – you're too young to understand, you know. And then my my freshman year in high school is the year that we cut my uncle out of the rafters when he tried to hang himself. And, you know, so there's, you know, there's a lot of events that had led up to, to you know, the post-traumatic stress that I, that, and the thing of it is, is that, you know, people call PTSD a, a, a veteran's disease, and it's not. Like, you just need to witness something traumatic, and it can, right. it can really mess with you really, really, really bad. Uh, so anyways, we got married, had the two kids. I was farming with the guy. Um, and then while I was farming with this guy, um, I got hired for one of a really, really good in town job. And I started doing parts and, and, um, uh, inventory for Studer super service. Um, <laughs> then started having marriage problems again. Uh, I was, an, a, I wouldn't call myself abusive, but I, my stepson, we had a bad night, really bad night, where I did not keep my emotions in check. I've talked about this before, but um, he was old enough to know better. But it doesn't make it right. I mean, he he was he was crapping all over my house, 
and uh, I was back in the bottle a bit, which was against my probation. Um, I wasn't happy in this marriage for numerous reasons, uh, and I just kicked the living crap out of him one night. I mean, I kicked him in the ass a few times, uh, smacked him around, spanked him, you know, just absolutely no control over my emotions at all. It was one of, one of the most disrespectful, worst events of my entire life. Um, and the next day I talked to the babysitter and I'm like, ah, I need some help. I can't. Well, then I'm all of a sudden I'm on a probation hold and, you know, all kinds of shit going on that, uh, right back because, you know, it's expensive to go to get therapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's expensive to, to, to go to talk to doctors and stuff. And you, so I started to self-medicate again and got kind of back in that same, kind of got back in that same, uh, same mode. Um, and then, um. Uh, was they, so they couldn't get me in anywhere. So then I ended up uh, signing up for an anger management class over in Lafayette County. Um, and it was really kind of surreal, Bill. When I went into that class, there was a, the, the gal that facilitated it was very anti-men. Um, basically said that, you know, only men can abuse, women can't. Hmm. Which I could prove her wrong numerous times. Uh, and uh, everybody else that was there was court-ordered to be there. I was there voluntarily. Um, but I did get quite a bit, quite a bit out of that, um, and then ended up getting divorced again. Anyways, you know, so you know, my first wife gets pregnant by my best friend. We get divorced. I mean, that was kind of an easy one. Uh, this one, we just it was just it was just toxic. It was just terrible toxic. Uh, Should have got out of it years before. I but I will I will you know, my two kids are the best thing that ever came out of that. I absolutely adore my kids, um, and then. Uh, I was working at Studers at, at that time, and then uh, uh, there was a gal whose husband died by suicide, who I had sold them some machinery, stopped out to see her. It was not too, it was just before Christmas that it happened, and then I stopped out there a little bit before New Year's, and, um, you know, we just got to talking, and we kind of hit it off, you know, or whatever, and then kept it kind of on the down low, and then we started dating, and I was back into farming and trying to be in working in town and kind of busy, you know, <laughs> doing, doing that kind of stuff. So, um, and actually the new year's Eve, she didn't have, well, obviously, you know, her husband had been dead for a little while now and it was the first new year's Eve without him. And, um, and, uh, I was kind of seeing somebody and I was like, it wasn't really going anywhere. And I'm like, why don't I bring out pizza and, you know, she's like, well, bring some, bring some alcohol too. And I'm like, all right, fine. So I hadn't drank at that time for like five years then. And, um, or three, no, I guess it was three years. And, um, I had a couple and honestly I was fine. Like, it wasn't like that, like the last time that I broke, the, broke the rule. And, you know, then all of a sudden I was like drinking heavily. Like it was just, it was fairly social, you know, there's not a, not a lot of trouble with it or whatever. Uh, we gave each other a new year's kiss and it was just casual. I mean, it wasn't anything super serious or whatever. Um, and that's pretty much kind of the way things kind of the way things went up until up until that point. Um, and then I don't know. Do you have any questions? Like, no, you're doing okay. good. So I just want to make sure that I'm not like like I'm not, not stepping on your toes. There, there's no quiz at the end. Okay, of this, cool. Is there? Oh, thank God. Uh, wait, no, yeah, for you. But so um, it was interesting. The dynamic that Marie and I had it was kind of interesting because I talked to her quite a bit about the suicide from her husband, and uh, I mean he did it right in front of her. Um, she watched the whole thing happen, and you know they they were in an argument in the middle of it, and. And he told her to go milk the cows, and then he told her to turn around, and he pulled the trigger and um, didn't die instantly. So here she is, 23 years old, having to make the decision to take her, her spouse off of life control in front of – or life support in front of her entire – and his entire family, you know. And, um, you know, those – some of those nights when I started to sleep there, you know, sleep on the couch or sleep on the floor or whatever, because she couldn't, she didn't want to go back upstairs and sleep because, you know, that was their, you know, their bed together or whatever, you know, and I'd sleep downstairs on the floor or the, the other couch and she'd wake up just screaming, you know, and, and so I would listen to her, you know, talk about what was going on and we tried to get her in to see somebody and even then it was a freaking pain in the ass. And uh, so in 2013, um, 
I had gotten asked by, uh, I, well, actually, let me back up. In 2013, I, I started writing. That was when blogging was starting to become really, really popular. And I was blogging for Farm Bureau. And uh, uh, I was County Farm Bureau president at the time. And uh, two of my articles got picked up by the Wisconsin Farm Bureau. And one of them was about how uh, this cow that my that Marie had had that we bought super cheap and she was one of the first jerseys that we bought and she was supposed to go to the slaughterhouse she was on the truck when we bought these other ones paid 200 bucks for her became the biggest pet gave us heifer calves every year beautiful if you didn't freaking pet her she'd, she'd <laughs> shove her arm you know shove her head underneath your arm a hundred times you know until you pet her and stuff and and uh anyways um the last winter that we had her uh all of a sudden marie calls me just scream we so we had her out in the pasture and never brought her in. She could just come up whenever she wanted to. She was old. She was older when she when we got her, and then we had her for you know quite a few years. And um, anyways, uh, all of a sudden, so we put her in this sh- this one shed that we had so that she could you know get around easy because it was cold. Marie calls me, just bawling her eyes out. She's like, "Oh my god, Emily was pregnant." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> so apparently, her and the bull had a little rendezvous yeah, somewhere. <laughs> and uh, beautiful little heifer calf. And then a couple of days later. Emily died, and I, you know, to watch a farmer lament over an animal, like, she was one of the family. Uh, Marie ended up getting a tattoo of her face, uh, of Emily's face on the back of her uh, shoulder and stuff, and I had a couple of plaques made, you know, embossed plaques and stuff, and and uh, so that one went viral. Um, social media was just starting to kind of pick up, and then the next one I did was about men and mental health. And, uh, you know, I find it ironic, and I see this all the time. I'm like, I don't know why men can't talk about mental health. For, for crying out loud, the first three letters in mental are men, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I wrote a blog about mental health and depression and stuff like that, and the response was ridiculous, Bill. Oh, my God. And, but not all positive. Right. You know, there was still quite a bit of negative, and, and uh, you know, people were like, well, you can't say things like that. And I'm like, if I'm talking about myself, I'll say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you like it is. Right. So Casey Langan at that time was the uh, media director for for uh, WFBF Wisconsin Farm Bureau Federation, and him and I got along really really well. Casey's a, a, a straight up guy, very very down to earth, very honest, um, and his wife worked for uh, a nonprofit in in Madison, and she so she, Casey had her get a hold of me. And she said, would you be interested in speaking at this event that we're having through Dane County Safe Communities? It's called Guys Night Out. Well, shit, Billy, Guys Night Out, like pizza, <laughs> football, some beer, you know, right, stuff. Right. Like, yeah, man, I'm in. <laughs> so anyways, I'm like, what do you want me to talk about? And she goes, something along that same line in your blog. And I'm like, you want me to talk to men <laughs> about mental health? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, is it pay? <laughs> you know? like, so, so anyways, um, so my best friend Scott went with me, and then my uncle Guy, who's the one who uh, uh, tried to die by suicide uh, by hanging himself in the rafters, and uh, his best friend um, all went up to Madison that night, and uh, we stopped at McDonald's on the way up there, um, and I got a chicken sandwich because I wasn't constipated. Uh, so, but anyways, I was kind of hungry and, and, uh, I'm looking at my speech and I hate writing speeches, Billy. I, yeah. I'm a, you know, I was a state extemp winner, you know, and extemporaneous speaking is basically you to pull the, pull the topics out of a hat and then you get, you know, 20, 30 minutes to do a, you know, five to 10 minutes. I never use note cards. I'm not a facts and figures because I think that's stupid. Like I just want to know the nuts and bolts. I don't need this other stuff. I mean, unless right. it's really, really critical, but otherwise no. So we, uh. So we get just about to Madison, and I rip my speech up and throw it in my McDonald's bag. <laughs> and my uncle and Scott both the same. Wasn't that your speech? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, what are you going to talk about? I'm like, I have a clue. <laughs> so, but I said, I'm not inspired. Like, I don't, I just, I don't, like, when I sit down to write, like, I just, and it's done. Right. Same thing with speeches. You know, if somebody came in and said, hey, Dits, we want you to talk about this, I, Dick Meske, who was my my ag teacher, was always like, Ditzenberger, you're that guy that if you can't dazzle him with brilliance, you're gonna baffle him with bullshit. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but thank you, you know. <laughs> so so anyways, uh we get we get up in there and and uh we're talking, they introduce me. And well okay, so the first thing is we walk in and it's not all guys. 
<laughs> and I'm like, nobody's supposed to invite the girls to guys' night out. Like, who the hell's idea was this? So now I got to think of new jokes because I can't tell, you know, right. my mom jokes and my wife <laughs> jokes and my girlfriend jokes, you know, stuff like that. So anyways, um, and people started coming up and introducing themselves and stuff, you know, and I'm like, God, this is a, this is a crowd that is not, because I'm thinking, oh, I can like, like, I was thinking I could relate it to agriculture. Like, <laughs> these people probably don't even know that there's farmers, for crying out loud. So uh, they were introducing me, and they started about started talking about, you know, mentioned that I was in the Navy or whatever. So I get up there, and I was kind of explaining my Navy career, and it clicked. And I was like, so when I was in the Navy, we were on the second largest displacement ship next to an aircraft carrier. So in order for us to go, like, down um, the locks and dams or to get back home safely or to go down – you know, some treacherous waterways, we'd have to call a tugboat. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, tugboats, you call them up and you can't see them, but you can hear them. You see little puffs of smoke and you hear a little toot toot, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, the, so when you're going into port, you know, you, you stop the ship, you stop this great big ship in the middle of the water, and you shut her down. And there's just a sense of calm that comes over you because there's no sound. There's a little creaking and stuff like that, but it was just, it's just like, ah. Yeah. And you feel this little poop. And like, oh, that's the little tugboat. And you can actually feel yourself moving. I don't care where you're standing on this big ship. You can feel yourself move. And you have no control over it, and you don't care because you know the little guy that's doing it knows exactly what they're doing. Right. And then all of a sudden you feel another little boop. And then, you know, they, you know, voice comes along the lo across loudspeakers, you know, safe at home. They don't call it safe at port, but you're safe at home, basically. You know, same thing going down treacherous waterways. You know, they get you down through there because you can't maneuver very good by yourselves because you're a big, big ship. And I, and I said, you know, this is like life. Like, what if you could call somebody when you're having a rough, you know, when you're in rough seas or you need to get home safe or you just need to feel safe or you need to feel calm. And, you know, and so we're on the way home and now I'm just invigorated because everybody came up to me afterwards and they're, Oh my God! This was the you know best speech I've ever heard. Blah 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 blah. Still no pay, but whatever, you know. <laughs> so on the way home, I says to Scott, I says Scott, 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 Scott. I says, Dude, I want to start a nonprofit. And he's like, Well, you already farm. And I'm like, No, <laughs> like I want a nonprofit that doesn't have as much government regulation. And then I found out that was a crock of crap too. Right. Uh, I used to like not have any gray hair, and then I started a nonprofit. Now I, you know, between kids and and starting a nonprofit. But anyways, I'm like, no, I want to start a nonprofit that helps people. Like, I, I just, like, I was inspired tonight. Like, I want to get guys to open up about the crap that's going on within them. And not just guys, but we're the ones that struggle. I mean, women talk about their mental health all the time and, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. And so, anyways, I sent him an email at, like, 2 o'clock in the morning because I woke up and I'm like, oh. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to base this off of a tugboat. <laughs> so I came up with an acronym, TUGS, because, you know, in the military, everything's an acronym. <laughs> right. Talking, understanding, growing, and supporting. And, uh, and you know, we have a tagline that's, you know, even big ships need a little help sometime. Right. And so I set it off at the court of Scott. Called me the next morning. He's like, dude, what the hell are you doing sending me an email at 2 o'clock? And I'm like, but I was excited. Like I, would, <laughs> like, I didn't want to forget this or whatever, you know. And nowadays, like, you send a text message at 2 o'clock in the morning. Like, it's nobody's business. But apparently back then, it was kind of frowned upon. <laughs> So in 2014, we formed Tugs. Uh, Scott's my vice president and also my Tug. But they, the the idea behind Tugs is that it's that person that you can talk to that's not biased, that's not your spouse. That's I mean, Scott's my best friend, but Scott's – so, like, like so one day I sent Scott a text, and I'm like, dude, I'm having the crappiest day ever. He's like, why? What's the matter? And, it, and the way it works is, like – as the tug, you say, you know, do you need me to talk? Do you need me to call you? Do you need me to listen? What do you mean to do? And so Scott's like, what's going on? What do you need me to do? And I'm like, just listen. And he's like, all right, fine. So I'm texting him. I'm like, so I specifically asked Marie to put leftovers in my lunchbox. And she packed me some crappy sandwich. <laughs> and he's like, are you freaking serious? This is what you're upset about? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, dude, get over it. Brutal honesty. That's part of it. The other part is, is when the guy that I farm with got cancer four years ago and I literally bawled my eyes out for almost an hour straight, not being it. Scott was the guy that listened to it on the other end, non-judgmental, you know, and all I tell you, Scott, I got some bad news. I need to talk to you. Please call me as soon as you can. Scott called me. 
and I just he goes, "What do you need?" And I said, "I just need you to listen. That's all I need you to do. I don't you just shut up. Don't." And part of the problem in our society, Bill, is that we have been trained somehow, and I don't know what makes us do this, but so many of us in society have been trained to listen to respond Mm -hmm. instead of listen to listen. And that's the idea behind tugs is we also train people how to listen to listen. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times people, you know, people that contact me aren't necessarily in a full crisis situation. They just want somebody to fucking listen and not judge. Right, right. They want that opportunity to be vocal and, you know, for guys, it's, it's guys, for us, it's different. Like, you know, you probably heard the same thing. Quit crying. I'll give you something to cry about. Right. Right. What is wrong with crying? God gave us that ability to do that. You know, if you're sad, cry. When my grandfather died, I bawled my freaking eyes out. And there were still people that were like, dude, boy, men don't cry. And I, I hate that. I, I hate that stigma that's behind that. I, I, and, and when you look at, when you look at suicides, you know, for as actively involved as I've gotten with everything involving suicides, you know, <clears throat> people that have failed at their suicide attempts, men that have failed at their suicide attempts that I've talked to have told me the exact same thing every single time. Nobody would listen to me mm-hmm. when I didn't know how to portray my feelings. And we tell men that they have to be strong. We tell our young boys from day one, you need to be strong. You need to be strong. You need to be strong. Well, it's sometimes being strong means letting it all out instead of keeping it all in. You know, we tell, oh, you, you, need to be a, you need to be a man for your wife. Well, you know what? If your wife's having a bad day and she wants to sob on your shoulder and you want to cry with her because you feel bad for her, what the hell is wrong with that? Right. When did we ever say that that was a bad thing? Why do we say that it's a bad thing? Well, who wrote these rules to begin with? Exactly, you know, and that's and and that's one of the you know that's one of my core values um, with tugs is to get rid of the, all of those stigmas that go along with it. You know, when somebody you know, people they they laugh my my little dies laughing when I say this. So I've been diagnosed with PTSD. I've been diagnosed with bipolar two which is just a step above bipolar one. But if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. You know, I'm going to excel at this bipolarism. Uh, depression, um, some uh, uh, borderline uh, personality disorder. Uh, but I have like five different anxieties. I have relationship anxiety. I have speaking in front of people anxiety. Uh, and I speak in front of lots of people. You know, and, and people are like, oh, how'd you cure it? I'm like, there is no cure. Right. Like, there are like there are drugs that help, and I'm not on any, any drugs anymore. I have taken some. I'm telling you right now, folks, if, if, if a doctor recommends it, give it a shot and talk to them. Have the conversation with them and say, you know, this is working or this is not working. Help them with your with, – uh, adjust your, you know, adjust your, your, your levels. I actually take CBD every day. I swear by it. I'm off of $1,800 worth of psychotic uh, drugs because of it. But that's me. It may not work for everybody. Some people like to go to therapists. Some people like to just come and, and, and talk to me. Like, you know, I, I just – nobody knows this yet. I just got qualified as a mental health life coach. Um, I'm also going to be taking classes in January to become a uh, to become a peer specialist. And in order to become a peer specialist, you have to have lived in experience. So after I get my peer specialist uh, certification, then I'm going to get specialized in addiction recovery and mental health recovery and be able to help people that like are trying to get themselves better. Like they're not in that immediate, immediate crisis right. situation. They've kind of gotten past that point. But I'll talk to anybody. I've, you know... Um, I'm also QPR certified, which is question, persuade, and refer. And we tell everybody it's like CPR for mental health, but it's basically for me to be able, you know, I can train people now to be able to come up to you, Bill, and say, hey, Bill, are you, are you thinking about killing yourself today? And if you say yes, you know, what do we need to do to help you? And then you go into the persuade part. You know what, Bill? There's people that like you. Ditzenberger kind of likes you. Like, you want to be around for him, don't you? You know, right. but you get that persuade the, the, to, to, to tell them what their value is. Because we as people don't tell ourselves our own value <coughs> nearly enough. Right. And the people around us aren't going to tell us most of the time. You know, everybody's in a, you know, cutthroat society type thing. You know, you don't hear, you know, you don't hear good things at work all the time and stuff like that. You know, my my montage is I treat I teach people to love themselves first. 
because we don't love and respect yourself first, you can't help anybody else anyways. And I True. know there's probably people that are listening like, dude, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. But think about it. Who do you wake up with first thing every morning? Yourself. Who's the first person you see in the mirror? Yourself. Who's the person who who sits in the driver's seat with you on your way to work? You know, all those things involve you. So you're with yourself 24 hours a day, right. seven days a week. Um, but then, and so then you get the persuade part out of it. And then the refer part is, okay, I'm going to, you know, who do you feel comfortable talking with, Bill? You're like a, like a pastor or is there, you know, a mental health life coach that you do or, or younger kids? I mean, I've, I've taught QPR in front of nine and 10 year old kids because we have nine and 10 year olds thinking about killing themselves. Oh, most certainly. You know, and, and it's the, you know, I don't feel like I'm good enough for my dad. I had a conversation here not too long ago. Um, I was talking to one of my friend's littles, and he's, I want to say he's around eight, eight or nine, somewhere in there. Anyways, we're sitting there, and he goes, Mr. Jeff, he goes, you talk to people about, the, like, those people that, you know, want to hurt themselves, right? And I'm like, you mean people that want to die by suicide? And he's like, yeah. I go, yeah. And he goes, well, can anybody do that? And I said, well, sure, anybody can do that. And he says, and he's and uh, he said, "Well, I, I, I think I should talk to somebody because I, I know somebody who's, who wants to end their life." And I'm like, "Oh my!" I, I, he goes, "I was li- over. I overheard a conversation, and I know I'm not supposed to listen in on conversations, but I heard it." And I'm like, "Like, is this one of your little friends or what?" And he goes, "No, it's my dad." Oh wow! And the thing of it is, is that you know we've kind of got to the point in society, Bill, where we talk about we talk about. Um, you know, we talk about cancer. We talk about uh, sexual abuse. We talk about pedophilia. We talk about all these other bad things that are happening in society. We're not still talking. We're still not talking about mental health. We as veterans are hit by it probably worse than anybody. You know, so you've got you've got the you know twofold. The, the twofold. The interesting part of the veterans that I work with is twofold. Is one, you know. 90% of them are men who've been told their entire life not to not to talk about their feelings. The flip side of it are the females that are veterans that I talk to that are like, well, nobody, th- everybody thinks because we were female, we didn't go through the same stuff, so we don't want to talk about it. You know, so there's both there's both sides of that. And, and when people, when I tell people that they can talk to their kids about suicide, they're like, no, I can't. Why not? We're going to, we'll talk to our kids about sex and making sure that they don't get pregnant early on, but yet we don't want to talk about 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 suicide or about mental health and 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 i've got a female friend who just recently even said to me she's like oh i'm having a rough day but i gotta be strong for the kids and i'm like no you don't right she goes yes i do and i go no you don't i says here's what you need to do so you need to sit down with your children and you need to say hey, mom's having a bad day mm-hmm. and we're going to come up with a plan so if mom's having a bad day we're going to have like a safe word for lack of better terms if mom says hippopotamus, you better stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> and you better go to your room, you know, or whatever. And I said, because now you're doing a couple of things. One, you're making it okay for that conversation to happen. Mm-hmm. The kids are suddenly hearing, oh, so having a bad day is okay. And you can talk to somebody about it, which is going to give them their opportunity to say, mom, when I say penguin, I just need you to sit and talk with me because I'm having a rough day. Right. Opens that door. Opens that door. And then when they become functioning adults and they get into relationships or they get into jobs and stuff like that, now they're going to be that person that either someone's going to talk, come and talk to and they're not going to judge them or they're going to find that person that they can be open with. you know. And now we've suddenly bridged that gap and we've taken one of those stigmas right out of the, right out of the equation right from the get-go. Um, so <laughs> I don't know how much of my information you wanted, Bill. That is basically... <laughs> You know, kind of my story, my story in a nutshell. Um, but it's just, it's just funny how, you know, a ship in my military career. Like I think about this. Like, what if I would have joined the Air Force? Like, what would my acronym be? You know, or something. But if, I mean, it just, it's kind of cool how that whole thing just, you know, you know, came together. And yeah. and uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 nice to to. We're probably maybe at two to three percent of the of the, 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 the people that we're talking to getting them to get to this point but at least the conversations are starting to happen well I can tell you from uh, 17 years of dealing uh, law enforcement with a lot of suicides that the conversation whether it be with the parents um, 
a friend, a, a male friend, probably could have saved me a lot of investigation time. And also a lot of having to go up and say sorry mm -hmm. to the parents. Mm -hmm. And for anybody out there that's listening that is thinking about suicide, uh, my biggest thing is, is your family asking me why you did it. And I don't know you. Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to answer that? I think you and I have talked about this before. And they want answers. Yeah. And it, why put people you care about in that position? Just talk. So my little is 13, 14 now. But when she was 13, we were talking. And she actually went to um, Southwest, uh, Southern Wisconsin, um, Southwest CAP, which is the community action program. And, and they, uh, they had given me an award for my work with, with suicide awareness and mental health. And she asked a ton of questions. But it was funny then, a few weeks later, she sends me this message on Facebook, and she's like, hey, so, like, you do shirts for your nonprofit, right? And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, do you ever put sayings on them? And I'm like, well, right now we have all the, you know, hotline numbers and stuff like right. that. And, and um, she's like, well, I think you should do one, and you should put a saying on it. And I'm like, well, do you, do you have something in mind, you know? And she's like... Yeah, so suicide doesn't end depression. It just passes it on to somebody else. And it does. And Billy, it, it, it hits me hard when I, and like, I literally teared up. And she's like, I was just reading through some quotes, and I just, that one really means a lot. That one really, like, really meant a lot to me. And she's right. You know, when, in the, in the, in the, th the thing that I tell people all the time, especially like when I do QPR trainings and stuff like that, you know, you hear that a lot. Why oh, don't I have that conversation? I'll tell you what. It's better to have that conversation. The conversation about suicide is a lot less hard than listening to 15 minutes of a eulogy and explaining to you the family or knowing that you could have done something and didn't and trying to face trying to face the family. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I can remember when a young lad in, in Monroe died by suicide and Parker at that my son Parker at that time was like fourteen or fifteen and had a Twitter account, which I had no idea. <laughs> uh, I wasn't that bad of a parent. But anyways, <laughs> um, he uh, he had uh, people were just saying about, Oh, we're so sorry, or oh I wish we would have said something, or, oh I wish we and Parker's like, What difference does it make to him now? He's right. not here anymore. You can wish all you want. You should have done it in the first place. Now you need to go help his family. And he got lambasted like these people. And, and I, you know, I, I said to Parker, I says, you're spot on, dude. I said, I can't, I can't help you in this situation because I don't have a Twitter account, so I can't respond. But I'm like, dude, hold your ground because you're right. You're exactly right. And I tell people all the time, I'm like, I would much rather take an hour, two, three, four hours to listen to the crap you're going through than to take 15 minutes to listen to your eulogy. And, and people tell me, they're like, well, what can we do? Like, what can we do different and stuff? And and this sounds really cliche. And you and I have talked about this before already. And with the political climate that's going on right now, you see it on my Facebook all the time. Like, freaking be nice to people, for starters. Right. Yep. Just be kind. But one of the things that I do is that every day, I started out with just sending out 20. I used to do a text message. Now I do it with Snapchat. And if, for those of you that want to what a 50-year-old grandfather has with Snapchat, I used to have a really pretty daughter in high school when she was in high school. And so I wanted to make sure that she was <laughs> going to find out. She had two Snapchat accounts anyways. So what I was seeing was just the good, you know, the clean stuff. But anyways, so I'm using a social media platform, and I find inspirational sayings. Or I might even do something myself where I, like, videotape myself and be like, hey, you, you, yeah, you, you listen to this. Have a great day. Mm -hmm. And send that out. The interesting thing is that I started just doing that for 20 people, 20 random. I'd have a 50 plus percent, 50 plus percent response rate every day of, man, I needed to hear that. Mm -hmm. So if 10 people are telling me that, how many other people are 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 needing to hear that? The other thing is is that now I'm sending out like 150 <laughs> plus the 20. And I'm still getting an over 50% response rate. Here I thought I was special. <laughs> Every day. You are special, Bill, but just in a special <laughs> way. But but words are impactful. And and you know, one and I'll I just want to tell one other quick story about my my quick trip cat guy, but but you know, we come in contact with people every single day, mm -hmm. complete strangers. 
You know, and it's easy for me to see Bill and say, hey, Bill, how's it going? And we give each other crap at the DMV or we see, but we know we have each other's back. I mean, right. We are brothers by 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 veterans. We are brothers just because because we're guys, because we have some commonality. We're, we're, we're biker brothers. But, but at the end of the day, you know, we give each other crap about Air Force versus Navy, just like all the other groups do. But we're going to be there. Right. We're going to be there. And this is why I struggle so much with the fact that men, especially veterans, won't talk to other veterans about what's going on. Now, a lot of veterans, the, the struggle with part of that is, obviously, is that if they're going through the same thing, it's hard to find where the repair part is right. of that. But in regards to strangers, so I'm at Quick Trip one day, and you know how it is when you're around in your local places around here, it's like, Hey, how's it going? Good. How's it going? Good. Hey, you look nice. They good. I did this at Quick Trip one morning, and and uh, one of the guys that I said, "How's it going?" He goes, "What do you care?" <laughs> and I stopped, and he says, "Cause I asked. I said, I just want to know if you are, you know, having a good day." Not really. And I'm like, "What's going on?" He goes, "You really want to? You really want to know what my why I'm not having a good?" I'm like, "Well, yeah. Like nobody wants somebody to have a bad day." He goes. Well, you're just going to think it's stupid. And I'm like, try me. He goes, I think my cat's dying. And I was like, you think your cat's dying? Like, what, what makes you think that? Well, I don't know. She doesn't eat hardly at all. And when she does, she's like, eh, like gagging all over. And she drinks a lot. And she's lethargic. And I'm like, your cat is a hairball. <laughs> and he's like, what are you, a vet? And I'm like, no. But I had a lot of cats. <laughs> so I, I said, it sounds like a pretty common, which is, you know, common symptoms. Yeah. I said, start small, you know, and he's like, well, what do I do? What do I do? I'm like, dude, it's easy. Go to Walgreens or Walmart or Farm Fleet or whatever and get a, a hairball remedy. You know, feed it to it and the cat will barf up the friggin' hairball and life will be good. And he's like, oh, okay. You know, I'm like, hey, by the way, have a good day. He's like, thanks. So, it's, I don't know, four or five weeks go by or whatever, and I'm at Quick Trip again. It's not for the Glacier Donut. Okay, it's for the Glacier Donut. <laughs> but anyways, I'm getting ready to buy my breakfast, and this hand slams down next to me. And I hear this voice go, I'm buying this man's breakfast this morning. And I turn around, and here it's Cat Guy. Ah. And that's all I know him by to this day, <laughs> Billy, because I've never asked him his name. And I'm like, you don't have to do that. And he goes, oh, we need to have a talk. And I was like, okay. So he goes, can we talk outside? And he goes, sure. So we go outside. He goes, do you remember me? And I go, yeah, you're, you're the hairball cat guy. Or I said, you're the cat guy. He goes, you were right. My cat had a hairball. And I'm like, is everything okay? And she's like, oh, dude, yeah, she's a she's happy self. You know, everything's great and whatnot. And I'm like, that's really, really awesome. And I said, well, good. I'm glad you had a good day. Because, no, you need, to, you need to know some more. And I go, okay. He goes, so I had just moved here a couple weeks before this. From the other side of the United States. When I got here, the job I came here for was no longer here for me. Oh. I have literally moved my entire life to here. I have no family here, no friends here, nothing but my cat. And I told myself that morning, if my cat dies, I'm dying with my cat. Wow. And I said, you mean suicide? He goes, yeah. And I think about that every single day. Every single day, we have the opportunity to affect someone in a mm -hmm. positive manner. Every single day, we can take three, four, five minutes out of our day to change the course of somebody's history. Mm -hmm. And it's just by basically being nice. We don't have to agree on everything. It doesn't have right. to be all sunshine and rainbows and, and unicorns and stuff like that. But, you know, unless it's a social injustice, why can't we agree to disagree on things and just be freaking kind to each other? I, I, I'm in. I agree. 100%. You know, and, and, and the other thing is, too, is, is one of the common mistakes we make when it comes to mental health and when it comes to depression, that kind of stuff, is another thing that, you know, is becoming very popular right now. It's called toxic positivity. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to... Oh, cheer up, Billy. It's going to be better. <laughs> you don't have to do that. You can simply say to somebody, man, I hear you. Mm -hmm. yep. Sometimes, you know, and I have a little cartoon thing that, that I use on Facebook once in a while, and it's, it's, it's like the brain and the heart, and they like, you know, do you need, you know, are you okay? And, the, you know, they're like, no. Do you want to talk about it? No. And the heart just sits down next to the brain, and they just sit there. And you see a little smile on the brain. Sometimes that's all we need. Yeah. We don't need the, oh, you know, 
buck up, you know, it'll be okay, you know. Yeah, that's all great and fine and dandy, but sometimes it's a little bit over the top too, it and 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 it and it sends the wrong message on that way too, because we're all human. We're all going to have bad days. We're all going to have challenges, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to not be okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's still going. I still see the counter going. But we're still good. We might have lost the pitcher, but who knows? There it is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I could become a technical man. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, brother, it's always uh, a pleasure to sit down and talk with you. We don't get to do it nearly enough. Uh, we reach out to each other on a daily, uh, whether it be Facebook or Messenger or even called event, uh, Tia or uh, event back or what have you. And uh, I wish you'd answer your phone more often, though. I wish I didn't have to work as much. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Bill's version of swiping right is the end the call button. <laughs> I just giving you crap. I know you're. Busy. You never know. I mean, you just call it. I know. Yeah. You know, like you know, depending on what the question is or whatever. But I, I got a kick out of that. Like the last four or five times on a call, which have been nothing super important. But I'm like, Did you just kick me to voicemail. <laughs> you give it an opportunity to ring twice and cry it out loud. Oh, it just hurts my feelings. So. so I'm allowed to carry my phone, but I'm not allowed to answer it at work. It's uh yeah. So I, I Hey, when I stood security, we were allowed to we were allowed to carry a gun, but we couldn't shoot it unless we were told to. So I I feel your pain, Billy. I feel your pain. Oh my. Well, brother. To the end. You bet. All right. You bet. All right, y'all. Remember, head up. Keep marching forward.